All right, hello everyone. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present and honor with gratitude, the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Allie. You may recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location. I'm your host for this evening. Uh, I'm so excited to be introducing theoretical physicist Leonard Mladenov here to discuss his book, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to thank you all so very much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. If you haven't gotten your hands on a copy of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking books in chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in and grab a copy off the shelf, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving the house, we of course ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat over to our website. While you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the new year year, including an event or two in person, which is very exciting. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either uh, on the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat. But when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. For anyone, if there are generated closed captions available from the menu at the bottom of your screen, slowly live transcript button to disable them. Um, and finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, so now it's time for us all to settle in because without further ado, I, I'm so pleased to welcome Leonard Mladenov, author of best-selling The Grand Design, A Briefer History of Time, both with Stephen Hawking, Penn, uh, slash E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award winning Subliminal, The Drunkard's Walk, and Elastic. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of California, Berkeley, was an Alexander von Humboldt fellow at the Max Planck Institute and was on the faculty of the California Institute of Technology. The book tonight is Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking, which explores the extraordinary advances in psychology and neuroscience that have proven that emotions are as critical to our well-being as our thoughts. So in conversation this evening, I'm so happy to welcome our own Spencer Recti, author, events manager, and all-around excellent guy. So thank you both so much for being here. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to you. Howdy. Hey, thank how's you. it going, Thank Leonard? you for that, Allie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is, I think, my first time actually being introduced at one of my own events. Um, <laughs> I'm the lesser known of the two of us. Uh, I'm really happy to be uh, talking with uh, Letter Mladenov tonight, um, author of Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. Um, I think to start us off, I just want to uh, first ask uh, one of many questions, which is what drew you to your latest topic, emotion? And at what point did you know you wanted to write an entire book about it? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I am a theoretical physicist, and I started my career writing books uh, more related to that. I wrote, the, as you, or I think Ali mentioned, The Drunkard's Walk, which is about randomness and how it affects uh, your life without your being aware of it and how to, how to recognize that. And I, 
I wrote a memoir about Richard Feynman, if any of the uh, viewers uh, know him, an iconic physicist that I was lucky enough to know in my days at Caltech, and the books of Stephen, Stephen Hawking, and so on. And uh, at some point, I, uh, I got interested in neuroscience. Uh, one great contributor to that was a fellow named Christoph Koch, who's local for you guys. Uh, he yeah, was that's a, right. He, mm -hmm. Yeah, he was at Caltech, and now he's up in the Seattle area at the Allen Brain Institute, and he was an eminent uh, neuroscientist, and he studied um, consciousness, and I got interested in consciousness through him, and thought it would be interesting to write a book on that, and he he convinced me to write on the unconscious mind instead, which, is, which was interesting, but he, he I think he, he, was, uh, he was correct, and that was a good suggestion of uh, uh, we don't have a, a real handle on what consciousness is, but we have a good handle on the unconscious mind. And all, that means processes that go on in your brain outside of your awareness that nevertheless have a great effect on your thinking, your feeling, your judgments, and so forth. And so he invited me into uh, in, to participate in his lab. And for a few years, I, I, I uh, went to the seminars. I took courses there. I read uh, hundreds of uh, neuroscience papers and talked to him for hours on end. And... Um, and the out, what came out of that was the book Subliminal, How Your Unconscious Mind uh, Rules Your Behavior. And I had a lot of fun with that. And I also realized that I learned a lot about people and in particular, this one, myself. And it really, I thought it really helped me in, in my life. And it really raised my consciousness in many ways. So after that, I, I've uh, written two now two more books on psychology slash neuroscience. The last one, Elastic, was about where ideas come from and creativity. And as I sat down trying to think of whether I wanted to write another one, uh, I, I realized that through another friend of mine, Ralph Adolphs, who's a, a very famous uh, neuroscientist who does emotions research, that, that emotions was a really a good topic, somewhat parallel to the unconscious mind, because uh, like like the unconscious mind and emotions have a component that's conscious and unconscious, but uh, like the unconscious mind, uh, emotions uh, have a, a great effect on our thinking and our decision-making that we're not uh, often aware of. And you can learn a lot by understanding where they come from, what emotions are, why we have them. And in particular, that they're productive and not counterproductive, that they're, they're very useful. Uh, I, 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 I grew up in a, a culture, I think in the American culture, that mm -hmm. male American culture, where mm -hmm. it's, promotions are somewhat frowned upon and you're supposed to suppress them or not feel. And um, it's a little bit easier for women to get in touch or not that it's easier for them, but it's more acceptable or more culturally, re yeah. recognized culturally that they do that. But, but in general, promotions had a bad reputation. I'm going, well, not from what I'm reading here. <laughs> And in fact, uh, I, I realize that, that uh, the field of emotion research has exploded in the last 20 years and it's been revolutionized. And so that was very exciting for me to, to realize that. And Ralph, Ralph encouraged me not to write the book, saying that, uh, it, was, that it was, uh, was too much drama going on in the field and too much, <laughs> new stuff, too much new stuff coming out and the revolution happening. And I thought, well, that's for me, that's exciting. I, you know, plus... It means that there aren't a lot of books. There weren't really, when I started writing this, there weren't really any on, on, on the new yeah. uh, science of emotion. So, so I got excited by it. And, um, you know, it's a very long process uh, and uh, arduous process writing the book. But I, I learned a lot from it. And, and I changed the way I think about myself. And I'm hoping that that will be true for readers as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Could you actually talk more about that drama? Which is something I'm very interested in. Some of the some of the drama of emotional or like psychology and emotion science uh, over the last uh, twenty years. Well, or so. th there's old ideas die hard. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I, in the book, I talk about a few different threads that, that uh, of uh, struggle, and I'll just I'll mention a couple. Uh, yeah. uh, well, one was the idea that when I talk about motivation. That there's a separate circuits in our brain for wanting and liking. It's, it sounds a bit odd because um, uh, you think that you would want what you like and you like what you want, but it, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go that way. We can actually uh, separate those uh, and uh, and also study them separately and see how they interact. Um, 
Um, so another was uh, animal emotion. There's a, still a controversy, mm -hmm. even though I think I think it's more accepted finally that that animals experience emotion. But uh, the idea that animals experience emotion was controversial, and then maybe not so much for pr other primates or even some people going, well, maybe mammals do, but the idea that maybe that reptiles or even fruit flies do. And I talk about um, some experiments that David Anderson did on fruit flies, fruit fly emotion that are fascinating. So that was another, another area. Um, there's an, there's a still a lot of controversy about how emotions are formed in your mind. Um, and I talk about that in the book. Luckily that's not, uh, I don't feel that's so relevant for, for us, for ordinary people in terms of mm -hmm. understanding yourself and what your emotions do for you, because exactly uh, how they're forming, whether, um, you know, the sensory information comes first, the bodily stimulus, the conscious experience, all that, that that's, it's nice to try and, 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 and tease that out, but, but it's not crucial to our understanding of ourselves. Uh, so those are a few, a few of the things. Uh, and I, I would, I would say that uh, in, in, in general, the, the, the theory of emotion that was pretty prevalent coming into the 2000s really uh, was very close to the old Darwinian theory. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I'll stay with that is, and, and that, that'll, um, and then I'll say what's changed. <laughs> and that's a good uh, descriptor of in general, what the revolution is. Uh, Darwin was the first major scientific, uh, modern major scientific study of emotion. And he was interested in emotion because he wanted to know how it fit into his theory of evolution. And he studied all sorts of animals, in particular their facial expressions. And he studied um, emotion in other human cultures. And he came to the conclusion that uh, emotion plays an important role in animals and their communication since they don't have language. So am I happy with you? Am I angry at you? Uh, questions like that, warnings, oh, there's a predator nearby, Let's, you know, get out of here, or, uh, you know, situations like that. And, and, and in terms of humans, he saw that humans had those same emotions, and that we have uh, similar expressions, he, he thought, uh, facial expressions, and he f felt that they were universal amongst all cultures, and that they were, you know, uh, just another uh, um, advance from the animals. But, and he felt that we had six basic emotions, um, anger, fear, sa happiness, sadness, surprise, and disgust, and, and that they were all distinctive, uh, unitary emotions. There's one kind of fear, there's one disgust, those are singular emotions, and that there's no overlap. And, and he studied uh, or thought about how uh, our nervous system is connected and uh, and eventually in that theory it was incorporated that each emotion has its own part in the brain. So that was kind of the theory, kind of intuitive mm -hmm. theory that he came up with. And he felt that emotions were not useful in humans, that they were a vestige and no longer needed because we do have language um, and we have rational thinking, uh, which is a higher order of thinking and, and a better kind of thinking. And we should try and uh, not to have emotional influence. Yeah, so those are the tenet, basic tenets of, of his theory, and um, they're all wrong. Every, everything I just said turns out to, to, be, to be wrong. <laughs> right. So the revolution was uh, debunking all of that and getting people to accept the new the new ideas that replace those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like one of the many tropes in kind of this uh, in this pre revolution thinking is that there is in some way that the emotional brain is in some way opposed to the rational brain, but um, I think in in the book you write that emotion is not a war with rational thought, but rather it, it's a tool of it, um, and we we know that now. Um, but could you maybe expand on this and talk about how the rational brain works in harmony with the with the emotional yeah. brain? Yeah, and that's an important point. And uh, I should start by saying I talk about the rational brain is convenient, the emotional brain, the rational brain. There is no rational brain. Yeah, it's and like there's in no air quotes. In right, air quotes, yeah. right? Uh, it's not like, oh, this part, this is the rational brain. This is the emotional brain. No left side, right side. like Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not like that at all. Yeah, and, it, it, and, and that's a very important point because uh, the bottom line is that not only are emotions working together with rationality as you think and make decisions, but there's no separating them. There's no such thing as pure 
rational thought in the absence of emotion. Uh, any emotion state uh, has an inextricable effect on on your uh, on your mental processing. So um, here's how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, the best there's different definitions still floating around, and and, and uh, I think I mentioned that in one. One review article said they found 90 different definitions of emotions in the emotion literature. So, um, the, the <laughs> one that, they're, no, there's, you know, they're not that, some of them not that different, and yeah. overlapping, but every, every, unlike physics, where, where we really get precise and yeah. we, we make a mathematical definition in, 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 in neuroscience psychology, something like emotion, everyone has their own favorite uh, terminology, and some of them are hard, harder to really understand what do they really mean. But the one that I like best that makes the most sense to me as a, as a hard scientist, and I think uh, makes you know a lot of sense in the literature, is uh, it's from Ralph Adolph and David Anderson who talk about emotions as being a functional state of the brain. And so what 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 is meant by that is uh, is this that um, well think of it like you you have an iPhone and it has it, and it has certain behavior. Uh, when you're not using it, for example, it's it's, it's uh, downloading things, it's checking for stuff, it's mm -hmm. sometimes pushing you with notifications and so forth. But when it runs low on energy, it stops some of that goes to low energy mode, low power mode. So it's a different mode of operation, and that's really what each emotion is—a different mode of operation oh, for your brain that's tailored to a certain situations that we evolved in. But I'm even when I, I'm going to stop, I, I won't do this too much, but I'll put a little footnote yeah. there because when I say each emotion. Uh, it's not true that 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 these emotion categories that we name are um, are uh, unitary, uh, united, like, like separate, yeah, you know, separate. Oh, well, there's yeah. many kinds of fear, for example, right. there's many kinds of disgust, and so forth. So I might say each emotion is a is a uh, state of mental state, but actually, it's very. It, there's all like, like a spectrum of emotions. There's many different. Um, even the categories that we use, they're convenient, but there are subcategories and sub subcategories. And, and it's, William, if you go as far as William James, you think that every every feeling is, is its own. There's an infinite number of emotions and they're all unique. But whether or not you go that far, yeah. each emotional feeling is a state of uh, processing in your brain. And, and, and what that means is your brain is an information processor. Uh, you know, it's not really like a computer. It's very different, but it does take in data and put out results, decisions, or output of some kind, uh, feeling, or, uh, uh, thoughts, decisions, um, um, reactions to behavior. And if we, if we accept this on an abstract level, the separation, there's a, there's a, there is logical processing going on that, that, that executes rules such as if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of processing is going on, but before that process can work, the, it needs to know what it's working on. So you need to feed data into the process. You need to feed in the question that you're, that you're attending to. What, what are you focused on? What are your goals? What is the data that you're going to be crunching? For example, and it's not, it's not, there's not a cut and dried answer. Like what day is the data? Well, the data is, um, a lot of it is sensory data. What am I seeing now? What am I hearing? That seems like it's a definite there's a definite answer to that, but there isn't because most visual and auditory information come into your brain and get processed on the unconscious level. You're not aware of most of the sights and sounds in, in your environment at any given time. You're only aware, only some of that is presented from by your unconscious mind to your conscious mind because if you got all the data, you would be overwhelmed. Your conscious mind can't handle it. For example, when you're at a cocktail party and if we were talking, uh, we have a nice conversation going and the rest is just general noise until... My name is said, right? And suddenly, uh, I suddenly, yeah. I oh, I, I now I'm picking up what they're saying over there because my unconscious mind said, oh, hey, this could be important to you, right? Uh, this is this and just you happened. know that you're right. right. You know so, your mind so when I say that you're processing, pro yeah. So when I say you're processing data, the sensory data that is, uh, there's there's choices being made by your unconscious mind uh, uh, as to which data to process. There's always choices also as to what's important, uh, what's trustworthy, what what's doubtful. You have you have memories that you, that, that are called up at, 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 in the processing. Which memories are rel are relevant is, is an issue. Uh, what beliefs and knowledge? All these different factors uh, are kind of form a web around the rational thinking that, and, and feed into it. 
So the rational processing that, that you're doing is very much influenced by the emotions that's setting up the situation by that, that it's processing. And that's probably best if I just give you an example. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So let me tell you, I'll give you a, a lab, a real life example, and I'll give you a, a laboratory example because real life is good, but it's not a controlled system. And, uh, and the laboratory is good because it is a control system, but it's not very realistic. Uh, so we could put them together. And um, so let's take, take fear, take uh, the emotion of fear. So, so you're walking down the, the street and um, say, I'm going to meet you at, I'm trying to remember, Wild Ginger. Isn't that a restaurant out there? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a Vietnamese <laughs> yeah. restaurant out up in Seattle I've been to that, mm -hmm. that I liked. And, I, and say I'm going to meet you there and I'm, and, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm somewhere down, you know, a mile away and I'm walking there. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to order because I don't want to, I want to talk to you when I get there and not worry about the menu. And I'm trying, what, what maybe I need a shortcut. I'm trying to avoid some hill or something. And there's all kinds of things I'm thinking about. Um, and then something happens and, and makes me af afraid. I realize that maybe a certain area I get to is high crime area or I hear a funny noise. And now things change completely. I, I don't feel the hunger anymore. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm not thinking about the hunger. I literally, the hunger gets suppressed. You don't really feel hungry anymore. My hearing gets, in, the get, acuity uh, get, gets much boosted. So suddenly I can hear stuff that would, I would not hear, would not pick up, or at least would not register earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and also all sorts of, my goals, of course, change. My goal now is not to get there quickly. I forget about that. I think about what's so safe. Survive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so all this stuff that happens, um, uh, all these changes happen in my thinking. And so if you were to ask me any question or if I were to deal with a question like, where do I turn? Suddenly I'm, I'm analyzing that uh, much different way than I would have analyzed it before due to my difference in emotion. And, uh, and that, that's, that's a very deep thing. It sounds a little bit mundane as I'm describing it here because you know everyone, that, that's kind of obvious, but it, it really uh, happens on such a automatic unconscious level, even in decisions that are not, um, um, yeah, not 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 clearly related to to, to the fear, or not, right? Or that, clearly that, life or death, and that's where yeah. I want to get to the to the laboratory. So, so in the laboratory, scientists have studied how this differences in processing work. So I'll give you an example with disgust, um, and, and here's where we can distill it out out of the real life situation into something very quantitative and and, and definable. Um, disgust. Is associated with a tendency to to rid yourself of things, to expel. It's not just, of course, the, to expel what's in your mouth. If you if it be, if you, you eat something and then it, it's, it smells funny and it's disgusting, yeah. you want to spit it out. But but more generally, the emotion state of disgust has to do with a more general uh, tendency to expel things and to rid yourself of things, to unload stuff. So here's the experiment: um, researchers brought subjects into the lab. Uh, and, 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 and half of them were a control group and the other half, they, they wanted to, uh, induce into them a state of disgust. And then they were going to do a, 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 kind of a sham experiment. I forgot what they were doing, but so something to make them think this is the experiment, but then the real experiment came, uh, as they were leaving the experimenters asked to, to buy back a pen they had given them at the beginning. <laughs> and so and, and they, they had re repeated the experiment in one version it's a gift box that they had given them so yeah so now the idea is that uh the, the, those in a state of disgust well they're all both doing the same processing what is this what is this worth what kind of pen is it uh how much do i care for it mm -hmm. what does this brand sell for or whatever you're thinking about and then you pick okay here's my price right yeah you're making the, pretty much the same reasoning but one group is in a disgust state and one group isn't. And what they found was the group that wasn't in the disgust state asked for about four and a half dollars for the pen. And the group that was in the disgust state asked only two and a half. <laughs> so without them realizing it, this was affecting their, their economic reasoning, yeah. so, right, their economic thinking uh, without them even realizing. And when, when they asked them later, whether, you know, they were, they would interview them, they, 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 they denied that, 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 uh, disgust had anything to do with how much money they asked for and uh, so that's the kind of um, that's that's kind of how emotions uh, uh, work
uh, working yeah. your brain along with your rational rationality. Yeah, I think that's a great example of how, um, uh, so yeah, like he's in a laboratory setting like that emotions can be quantifiable like you can put a you can put it like a almost like a literally an economic number um on an emotion but i am curious as, as someone who you know started off in hard sciences physics mathematics um it must have been kind of a culture shock then transitioning to psychology where a lot of the uh, research involved is it's very even though there are attempts to kind of quantify emotions or the ways we think or the way the brain works um on a you know conscious level, it's or unconscious level, it's very difficult to quantify uh, emotions on a research methods level. Um, so I'm curious, what uh, you know, what are some of the ways that emotions are quantified uh, in a way that can be studied, um, you know, whether by neuroscientists or health professionals, and how has that changed over the years? Well, the simplest is, for instance, in this experiment, how do they know that they have induced a disgust state, right? They, yeah. Uh, so they, in fact, when the, this experiment was first done, they, they failed. They, um, they, they put the kids, the subjects, they brought them into a room that had old pizzas laying around and half drink milk, drank, drinking milkshakes that had dried up and crap <laughs> on the floor, you know, garbage and stuff. And then and then, and then when they, before they did the experiment, they, they, they would give them a questionnaire and they would try to determine whether they had induced a disgust state. Uh, and they could just ask them what you're feeling right now. So yeah. that's some, it could be as simple as that. And, and they didn't get disgust <laughs> because these were college yeah. students. And yeah. that was pretty much what you the rooms looked like. You can be asking for anything. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, they had to, they redid it with, and they used, this, they used fart, fart smell uh, to, to discuss <laughs> them. And, this, and, the, and that, that version works. So that was interesting. But it can be fair. It can be simple like that. But um, in the book, I have a, um, a series of what they call inventories where yes I was that. which are meant just for that so uh if these were meant to, to find if people um not in the moment but in general i uh, have a tendency toward one emotion or another so and they were developed uh often for the study of emotion disorders for example they want to know if people have uh a uh um you know um suffer from excess anxiety for example mm -hmm. so they need a no way to define that and to know if, if that's the case and and for, for other emotions shame guilt etc so they 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 develop these questionnaires where they would ask you uh some of them are 10 questions one of them was 100 questions um for different emotions uh there's different ones and, and they would ask a question and then you would answer it might answer might be on a scale of one to five you know, do you think you would do th uh, do this or not do this? Something or something mm -hmm. like that, and some of them a scale one to seven or whatnot, and you get scored, and then at the end it gives it gives a score, and 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 they these were generally validated with hundreds or even thousands of subjects to to make sure that, um, for instance, we're measuring what you were. Yeah, like if you measure. give it yeah. to the same people a month later, do you get the same answer? Yeah, or, or if, is, it, is it different every day? things like that. And, and you know, is the mean stable or is it, was it just peculiar, um, you know, just to, to see that, that the answers are stable and meaningful. And I present them for a few reasons in the book. I mean, one is that if you look at those questions, it gives you a real good handle on what these researchers mean when they talk about these emotions, shame, guilt, fear, yeah. and so forth. Because uh, you can see by uh, analyzing the questions or just by reading the questions, what they're getting at. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if you take them, I think it's very useful. See where your own tendencies lie, and it really helps you. Gives you, a, I think, a deeper connection to the science, to the subject, by uh, understanding yourself and, and and what your tendencies are, and, and and looking at what those, how what you know, reading about those emotions. It really makes it real and relevant for you. So I, I thought that was a that was really useful. But that's one way that they. They actually quantify. Uh, they 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 translate these tendencies to some numerical score. Um, so and, and just you know, even the the pen example that I gave, uh, in a way that the reading of how much you want for the pen is an indication of the degree of emotion or how at least how much it's affecting you. So they they have their tricks for trying to trying to do that. But 
in in psychology slash neuroscience, it's not it's uh, it's a lot different than it is in physics. And yeah, again, uh, you know, we 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 wouldn't do too well with with ninety definitions of, of yeah <laughs> of the same. <laughs> Um, now I was hoping, switching gears a little bit, I was, uh, hoping you could share a little bit more with us about one of my favorite anecdotes of the book, which is uh, at the beginning of chapter four, um, you tell a, a bit about the story of Paul Dirac, who is one of the greatest, you know, physicists of the 20th century. Um, and he famously said, uh, you know, I, I never knew love or affection when I was a child. My life is mainly concerned with facts, not feelings. And he was, um, but then he meet, Dirac meets his wife, uh, Margaret Figner, and, you know, he falls in love and suddenly he's writing to her that, you know, you, you make me human. I've never, you know, I've, I've almost as if he's never felt emotion in this way before. Um, and I was just ho hoping you could tell us more about, um, you know, Dirac's initiation into love and then what it meant for his physics and his reputation as a scientist as well, because I think that's, uh, you know, the important, the really important part of the story. Well, he felt that he, so right, he, he did, was not really in touch with his emotions. I don't know if today we would say, you know, if he was on the spectrum or what, you know, and back then we didn't have, yeah. any spectrum. the only spectrum we had was a light spectrum of light or electromagnetic spectrum. So um, when, when he, he really changed uh, through the, the love that he had for, for her and she was really amazing to put up with the uh, courtship period where he, where he did totally didn't understand uh, what it's like to deal with another person. Um, and then later when he felt that he had found emotion, he thought that it changed his life completely, made him happier and helped him in his physics. And I thought that the reason I have the story in there was uh, that because later, late in his life, uh, he was asked, uh, what's the key to your, you know, what, what would you tell somebody uh, and who want to do theoretical physics, what's the key? And he said, above all, yeah. to be guided by, by your emotion. And so I think to, for that to come from somebody who had to learn that lesson and who didn't have it and who was one of the top, you know, one of the inventors of quantum theory and one of the top physicists yeah. of the century, I thought was very, was very powerful, uh, a, a testament to the fact that they are not counterproductive. And, and you know, it, it's the, the same for the same reason that, really that I was talking about when you're doing your rational processing with your emotion, when, when you're doing physics, yes, it's mostly mathematics, but that mathematics is not done in isolation. Um, as you're, as you're doing it, you have to, you, you it, it's not as cut and dried as you, you know, people think you, 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 you don't know which way to go. What, what, usually when you're trying to solve something, you try this, you try that. There's a lot of choices to be made. There's assumptions to be made because usually you can't solve anything exactly. So you have to pick what am I going to assume is true and what am I going to approximate and pretend this isn't there. And that's one yeah. thing we do a lot in physics. I'll pretend that that term makes it so I can't solve it. Let's pretend the term isn't there. Let's yeah. solve it. And then let's try and <laughs> let's try and pretend we know what it does, what, what the effect would be of putting it in, you know? Right. And, and um, so, and all of that, all of that is very, much uh, um, governed by by your emotions and your um, your your unconscious mind and your emo and your feelings, and, and it's really that that makes it someone a great physicist, and that's where creativity comes mm -hmm. from too. It, it's not so. It's not the the you know grinding through the uh, the rules of mathematics to just blindly calculate it. It's it's much much more than that, and emotion uh, plays a, an important role in that. And that's yeah. what I would say. Yeah, I really can't imagine, you know, like thinking about Richard Feynman or, uh, or like, you know, not just physicists, but also, you know, astronomers like, you know, Carl Sagan without thinking about emotion. I mean, I think that's how, especially in the popular imagination. Um, yeah. And then, of course, that, at least that to me, yeah. Into mind motivation, too. Um, yeah. So I have a chapter on motivation, a chapter on determination, which are, have to do with feelings, um, not, not necessarily emotions per se, but it's related to emotion. Um, and I thought it was important to put in the book because without these kinds of feelings, it's important to realize you would not do anything. You would not yeah. start to talk. You would not get off your chair. Why mm -hmm. do you do anything? Uh, you do it because uh, you have a goal. You have a desire to achieve something. You have, you, you have a feeling that you want something to happen or don't want something to happen. That's yeah, the fear motivation. desire. Exactly. So we know that you have your wanting system and your liking system. Well, that's, that, those are feelings. And um, I wrote for Star Trek, The Next Generation, uh, back in the day. 
I know oh, you did? I, I had no TV. idea. Yeah, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I wrote for MacGyver too, and a bunch of shows. Uh, and uh, we had a character named Data, who, yeah. who supposedly had no emotion. Uh, now the earlier uh, series, uh, the original Star Trek, had uh, Spock, who had half mm -hmm. half human, so he could have some emotion. But Data had no emotion. And back then, had I known what I know now, I would have probably. Uh, uh, I was on writing staff for a year. I would have had some arguments with people about what Data would and wouldn't do. Yeah, because uh, well, because his character evolves in a in a way that's interesting. Uh, well, you know, because that's, that's a classic plot point too. Yeah, and his character has a certain will and a certain desires, mm -hmm. and a yeah, certain, it obviously has emotion. Right. I mean, obviously, we did an episode yeah. where where Data was was um, okay upset, yeah. and, and we wouldn't have said you know writing it that he was upset because he has no emotions, but he was obviously. Yeah coming from a place of being upset because he wanted to prove that he was a sentient being. Uh, if I remember it right, it was a long time ago and there was a trial held. Why would a computer yes. with, no, with no feelings uh, yep. care if it's mm -hmm. considered a sentient being or not? So obviously Data had emotion. If Data had no emotion, Data would sit there until Picard told him what to do or until in his environment, there was a trigger that was pre-programmed with a response in his head, so right. you know, so if he had a pro pre-programming that uh, if it, if there's a fire in the room, get up and leave, and the fire came out and he detected it, it would it would stimulate that one rule and he would get out, but he wouldn't in general uh, do anything. He would just sit there until there was either a particular trigger that caused him to do something, or maybe it was you know an order from from his boss. Um, and and uh, and we would do nothing. So emotion is important, and every you know. Every minute of your life uh, there, there is, is being uh, governed by that. And, and that's what drives physicists. There's a tremendous, if you talk to, uh, when I talk, used to talk to Feynman, you know, about the, a tremendous happiness and joy and satisfaction in discovery. And um, one story I told of Feynman in one of my books was that he had a, he had a letter from one of his former students who, said, who apologized to him and said, you know, I'm studying water waves now at this, I don't remember a company or someplace. I'm not doing great mm -hmm. um, groundbreaking fundamental work like you did. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, but that's what I do. I'm happy. I, I, I like it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that I, you know, if I'm a disappointment to you, but I, I, you know, always fondly remember you as my advisor or something like that. Right. Yeah. Feynman wrote back to him and said, uh, you know, don't think like that. I mean, he said, what you're doing is just as valuable as what, you know, as what I did. Solving a, a problem, getting to know nature is tremendously useful and satisfying and important, no matter what aspect of it you're doing. It doesn't have to be elementary particle theory. It could be water waves, or it could just be a problem that you decide you want to solve. And th th those are all equally valuable. And I applaud you for, for doing that. And, and he talked about what a great joy and pleasure he had out of solving physics problems. If we didn't have that, no one would solve the physics problems. It's hard. Yeah. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of work. It takes a lot of, I'm not going to the beach, you know, <laughs> because I got to sit here and solve this problem. Yeah. I would otherwise, you know, of course, you wouldn't even go to the beach without the emotions either. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you're making trade offs and sacrifices to do physics. So you're also probably sacrificing a lot of money because uh, a lot of physicists are smart enough that they could let's say go into the semiconductor industry and make 10 times as much money, but they decide to be a professor somewhere and study physics. So, um, but that's, those are yeah, all it's very much emotion and maybe not a uh, rational thinking brain as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a wonderful anecdote. I really love that uh, story about Richard Feynman, which is something I've uh, heard before. Um, I was also hoping uh, just kind of from a general overview perspective, if you could talk about also, um, what, how you approached putting together this book as well, you know, chapter by chapter, like how did you decide what, what you were going to talk about and what was going to go in here? I mean, emotion is such a broad subject, of course, and there are so many different, um, you know, wells to draw from and a lot, so much history to draw from as well. And you, and you're able to sum it down and, you know, so nicely and succinctly. Well, thank you. It, it, that was a process. Yeah. I mean, first I had to uh, get the lay of the land. Uh, it, it, it's like writing a review article as an academic. And when you write a review article, you, um, you on a, let's say a topic that, uh, that you're working on, uh, 
and you you read everything that that you can that that is, at least that's important in that area uh, and digest it and and figure out what everyone is saying and where it's going and so that's what I have to do first with emotions is get the lay of the land spent quite a few months doing that reading uh, probably those even those few months maybe hundreds of papers and um, talking to people who are um, important in the field interviewing them and and getting a feel for the subject because it's being that it's being revolutionized there's there was a lot going on and i had to i had to make sense of it as a whole co coherent uh part and 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 get, become able to ignore the little details that aren't important and to get what understand what really is and so that eventually crystallized into the different chapters that i have so at the end for example there's a chapter on regulation uh how, when your emotions are become counterproductive uh kind of I, I like the analogy with optical illusions or mirages your eyes sometimes make mistakes so do so do your emotions and they can be exaggerated uh over over stimulated or sometimes they persist too long um because emotions have that quality of persistence so you could be angry about something and now five minutes later you're in a completely different situation but you still have the anger from before so how do you regulate and control that so that there's a chapter on that there's a chapter on the emotional profile that we talked about where you can take these inventories and see how you stand in the, these different areas and you know there's so forth the chapter on what you know the, the effect of emotion on your thinking how does emotion mm -hmm. affect your thing so I, I picked uh wh whatever i thought were the would be the big areas to talk to and talk about and, and how they fit together and then i then i would in each one i would dive back in and start studying it again and um and learn as much as I could and try, you know, to, to figure out what, what's important there and what's the latest and what, uh, you know, to say. And when I got that figured out, uh, I, uh, I, I, I had to figure out how to say it. And I think that my, one of the, like, the trademarks of my books is that I try to do a lot of storytelling, find yeah. dramatic mm -hmm. uh, or humorous uh, or just interesting, unusual stories to tell to illustrate a point. I mean, not just to throw them in there, but to illustrate a point. So it's not a textbook. So if I can find a way to get into a certain topic without just starting off with the, um, in a scientific way, but to tell a story. Um, and then at the end, that story has a punchline or a point, And then I get into that point. I, that's a, that, I think that makes it much more fun for the readers and more memorable for the readers too. And mm -hmm. it's certainly also more interesting and fun for me. And based on my old days of storytelling in Hollywood, and you know, I used to write short stories since I was 10 years old. I, I think I have a knack for, for, for telling the stories and I put in a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of effort in finding the story. So I have some very, yeah. unusual, everything from head transplants uh, to, um, a guy paying his friends to shoot him to get sympathy from his <laughs> girlfriend. And I mean, there's just so much that the, Heath, the, the researcher who's sticking electrodes in the people's brains, trying to give them orgasms. Yeah. Half the time he's, just, <laughs> yes, I he's, yeah. he's killing them instead. And, and this, this was allowed to go on for like over a decade. I mean, this was obviously not yeah. recently. It was in the forties, but um, so I, I find out and I find those are gems parties. for me because uh, those are mm -hmm. really fascinating. So I want the book to be one where as you're reading it, you not only, learning about yourself and about emotion, but you're being entertained by these stories and pulled along. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's one thing I really love about your books is that the, the case studies are so interesting. And it's so, and it, those, like the case studies alone drag you along through the, you know, the, the narrative that you're telling. Um, could you tell, could you tell us uh, some of the most, or so, I guess maybe some of the case studies for this book that, that surprised you most? um you su surprised me you mean in, in the site or, or or just the most surprising uh, or i suppose story. yeah the most surprising or one of the most surprising well i think i mentioned that i mean i have to say I, I it's hard not to have the head transplants be one of the i mean but when i i was i was um it's in this chapter on the body mind body connection mm -hmm. so what could, i mean what could be a, a more vivid illustration of the severing of the mind body connection than to swap heads uh, I mean, I'm going about, <laughs> I would have never thought that that I would actually literally get that get yeah. get a story like that. But 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 um, the story is about how your uh, the, the chapter is about how how you, your bodily data 
your mind, ha your, your brain is highly connected to nerves that go all over your body, especially in the gut, for example, but through all your organs that are constantly reporting back, am I hot, am I cold, how's my digestion going, what's my heartbeat, and, and your brain, it, got, it has to balance all that to keep it right and to predict what's going to happen and, 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 and account for it. Like if, if you stand up, your brain doesn't wait till you stand up to change your, your blood pressure. You get faint and you set back down again. It, 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 as you're standing, it's preparing you for that change. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a very tight connection there, but, uh, and there's, there's interesting, I mean, other interesting story about fecal transplants and you, uh, you know, you can, they, they grow, they raise mice to have a sterile gut. And then they, 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 and then they have two kinds of other mice, uh, like nervous ones and calm ones. And they'll, they'll do a fecal transplant from the nervous ones into the blanks. And these, these, these mice now end up being nervous and they put the calm one fecal transplant into the other, others of those mice and, they, and they're calm so that they took on emotional characteristics based on a fecal transplant. I mean, it's crazy, amazing stuff. So I'm, I'm writing about all this and, um, and then I, I, I'm looking around for, oh, what's a real good illustration of the mind-body connection? <laughs> okay, they, they actually, I mean, that was a shock. I'm going, what? I thought I, like, I misread it. And then I start looking for, you know, I always look for other sources too. I don't yeah, believe in some of I, you read yeah. somewhere that, and they go, oh, yeah, let me find that somewhere else and corroborate yeah. it. And, and, but it goes all the way back over a hundred years with animals. But the shocker really was when I found out that, no, they're doing this in China today. They're talking about doing a, <laughs> you know, a head transplant. And I, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's crazy. So I, that, that, that had to be, uh, I would say the, um, this most shocking to me. I, mean, I could almost like not believe it. <laughs> that, yeah. That, that and there's quite a bit, and there was quite a bit of literature on it. There was even a paper called "A History of Head Transplantation" in an academic journal. I'm going, well, am I? You know, That's convenient. Yeah. Am I in a novel <laughs> or am I in a nonfiction <laughs> book? I mean, it's like. <laughs> so. Um, um, so before we go in a few minutes here, we'll go to, uh, we'll start taking questions from the audience. So for those listening, I just want to remind you to you know, submit your questions to the Q&A window below, um, and we'll start taking those in a few minutes. Uh, but before we do, uh, I do want to ask uh, a question about social media, which you talk about in the book, uh, and the way that social media companies have been able to codify the emotional value of your posts to um, not just give you, you know, extra dopamine to keep you coming back from it, but it's kind of been, you know, if we didn't really know it already, it's been recently revealed um, that social media companies are actually intentionally preying on hostile emotions, trying to inflame you in, in order to get you to come back. Uh, and this was big news back in October, I think. Um, there were, you know, a few whistleblowers at Facebook uh, in particular, who were talking about kind of, you know, the company's intentions to manipulate the emotions of their users and the massive amounts of experimentation and research that went into, um, you know, intentionally manipulating emotions, um, which of course has real world consequences. You have, you know, someone who's pushing those buttons could elect the next president or cause an insurrection, for example. So, I was just wondering if you could talk about, um, I think, I believe you call it sentiment analysis in these, uh, that, in these experiments that social media companies are using. So, 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 so the social media companies, let me back up. I'll try. I got it. Yeah. Okay. This question could be a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> and we got 10 minutes. So um, let's see. Um, and you want to take questions. So let me, let me, let me just think for a minute. Okay. Um, something called emotional contagion and uh it means what it pretty much what it says and and uh in the book i discuss why we have it and what you know go into more depth but uh we tend to share the emotions of of other people and uh and so this is something that that the, that the uh social media companies have studied a lot and um and we're interested in in learning about but how do you learn about it um you know, they do it by studying uh, the, the, the tweets or the Facebook entries of, of their p users. Yeah. But uh, you can't, they, 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 they want to do this massively and, and they don't have the manpower to read hundreds of thousands of people each making thousands of tweets or, or hundreds of tweets or even dozens. So they've invented a way, a very clever um, developed programs that can read the natural language. The computer can, can scan the, 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 the text and 
and conclude uh, what emotion the person is feeling from the text. Um, so this is something that a human could do. Like if, if you say, you know, that goddamn car cut me off, you know that the guy's angry, right? Well, the computer knows it too now because that's what sentiment analysis will tell them. So, uh, you know, um, so they, they've used that and, 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 they're, and what they're doing is using the emotional contagion to really pump up their, their usage because, uh, for example, fear and hatred are very strong emotions. And, and, and but when you are exposed to it, you tend to go along with that and then you'll go back to their web, to their um, app and, and you'll enter, you'll jump in. And, 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 and that way it's like a vicious circle and it builds on itself, but it builds on itself on their platform, which is what they want you to do. So yeah. kind of a quick summary, that's yeah. those are the kind of, and there's some very interesting scientific studies that have come out of that, by the way, uh, you know, along the way that, that are interested for scientists, but that's the, they're doing it for these more, I think, I'm afraid, uh, less constructive uh, purposes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, great. That, uh, that leads us to the audience question portion of our, um, of our program tonight. Uh, we have about seven minutes left here. Uh, let's see. So our first question comes from Melissa, who says, is it possible to truly separate or gain distance from emotion when one becomes aware of it rationally? Um, this idea, I believe, is consistent with the concept of, quote, wise mind, but I suspect it's not so easy to do successfully unless over time those emotions diminish when faced with rational interpretation. Well, uh, so that's emotion regulation is, is possible. Uh, it's possible to diminish or change the emotion that you feel. Uh, and there are uh, several methods that I go into. Uh, let me start with the one that yeah. you don't, shouldn't do. <laughs> and that no. we talked about that briefly <laughs> at the beginning. Um, suppression. So uh, a lot of people, especially males, are taught to suppress their emotions. So if you, if you get angry at someone who cut you off uh, on, in traffic, uh, maybe you try to just not feel it or suppress it or think about something else. That doesn't work very well, and it's also harmful. Uh, people who, who regularly suppress emotions have more heart attacks and die, tend to die younger uh, it's not a good thing to do. It, 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 the emotion doesn't really go away and, and the stress, uh, your body gets stressed and that's, that's not healthy. Um, so that's one, one way, not good. Um, expression is, is another way, um, meaning uh, it, to just talk about your emotion. So you, uh, your, the question had to do with rational thinking, but it's almost expressing what your feelings tends to diffuse them. So I don't know if you if you ever had the experience where you, you get really mad. I worked in a corporation for a few years, and mm -hmm. and, and you write a flame mail, we would call them, right? A, an email, that, an angry email, <laughs> and I would twice I a would, week. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, you know, <laughs> and hopefully you put it in in a you put it aside and don't quite mail yes. it yet. And then the next day you look at it and uh, oh, I better not mm -hmm. mail that. But meanwhile, it, it diffused your 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 anger. So that's a good uh, tool that you can, and you can do it talking to friends. There's different ways yeah. of doing it. Um, no, all the time. Yeah. There's reappraisal is a, a way of doing it where you, you, you spin doctor it. So um, let's say the guy cuts you off and you're angry because you're thinking that, I don't know, that, that it was insulting or he was being disrespectful to you or selfish. Uh, he's an ass, whatever, whatever thoughts are going through your mind. You could choose to reinterpret that. And go, well, maybe the person, the poor person's in a hurry is late for something, um, uh, you know, and, and, and had and, and is just doing that out of out of that focus, or maybe it, that person is just oblivious and didn't realize that they even cut me off and they're just a bad driver or whatever else you yeah. can do, and you focus on that and then you, you're not angry anymore. And the thing is that your brain, when it when it's making sense of what's going on, takes into account the situation and your knowledge and your beliefs and whatnot, and eventually a feeling comes out of that. And uh, you can, with your rational mind, you can divert that kind of, you can, you can change that appraisal of what, of what is going on to a reappraisal by, with your rational mind, by thinking about things in that, in that way. You have to have to believe it. You can't make up a story and say, I'm going to think it was that because I want to mm -hmm. feel happy and not angry, but you don't believe that. So you can't do that, but you have to convince yourself or find other, you know, spin on it that, that, that is reasonable to you and, and just think of it, learn to right. think of it that way. So there's a lot of different ways that, that you, you can use your rational mind to regulate. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see. 
Next question comes from Mason, who says, uh, and this is a good kind of finishing question, I think, as we wrap up here. Uh, what are some of the unresolved questions of emotion and where is the research going to take us next? Ah, well, that's always a, where are we <laughs> the, going? The, like into the future, yeah. Well, I, I mean, in science, asking the right question or going in the right direction is a large part of the battle. And of course, if I knew which direction that was, that would make me a genius because uh, I would be going <laughs> in the right direction that, that you know, that's going to lead somewhere. So, who, you know, who knows really, but um, I think that some of the most exciting uh, things that are going on now are is research into uh, the emotion circuits in your brain. That's a, be careful when I say that. I don't mean that there's a necessarily dedicated mm -hmm. circuits, but, but each emotional uh, situation or incident certainly has its tracings in, in your brain and to understand how that works and the, and how everything is connected is really important. Um, and I think will lead to a better understanding. And we used to think it was very simple that there was a different structure or a combination of a couple structures for each emotion. Like in the nineties, people thought the amygdala was fear, right? And, yeah. And now we know that. I think sometimes they still teach that. Uh, well, yeah, at least not, you know, of, yeah. first of all, there's many different kinds of fear and the amygdala isn't even involved in some kinds of fear. For example, fear of suffocation. Interesting. Does not yeah. involve the amygdala. And, and, um, and it is involved in other kinds of fear, but it's also involved in other emotions. It's involved in many emotions. So why are you calling it the fear emotion? Not only that, it, uh, the fear organ, it's, it, it's not even a singular organ. The amygdala, it, we now know, is made of, uh, we identify a lot of organs within it, sub-organs, so to speak. So it, even calling the amygdala a thing is, is maybe not quite so precise. Um, so it's just very complicated, but we're now... Um, having new technologies that allow us to, to trace uh, which neuron is connected to which other neuron and kind of get a wiring diagram for the brain and to, and to look at how, yeah. you know, which networks are being activated uh, in, certain, in what situations. So for, for example, we know there's a, uh, there's a network in your brain with different nodes in it that if, if stimulated, make you feel determination. And it's not determination to do anything like to climb a mountain or to finish the physics problem. It's pure feeling of determination. So <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of interesting. And you know, based on those, the knowledge that we can get that way, the hope is that we can develop um, drugs for um, to take care of disorders or uh, other techniques like transcranial electric stimulation and um, or just a better understanding of, of how the different parts of the brain work. So I, I think for me, that's uh, kind of an interest, a very interesting uh, and really exploding uh, area of, of research, but very, very difficult. It'll be many years, I think, before we really milk that. Um, yeah. Be, because, you know, just because you know how things are connected doesn't mean it, you you know what it does. Why? So, yeah. 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 Well, so. yeah, wonderful. I mean, difficult, but it sounds like exciting. So I am, yeah. uh, I'm really grateful for your time tonight. Uh, everyone. The book is emotional. Uh, we have copies here at Third Place Books at each of our stores at Lake Forest Park, Ravenna, or Seward Park here in Seattle. Um, or you can go online to thirdplacebooks.com or walk down the street to your local independent bookstore, uh, no matter where you are in the country. So um, I just want to thank you all again for coming out tonight. And uh, on behalf of the bookstore, uh, please be well. Thank you for a great talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leonard. Have a good night. Thank you.